Good. Kevin, the great Kevin Bales, welcome oh, to our working from home conversation with the Anti-Slavery Collective. Um, Kevin, it is a joy to see you on this today. And um, it's we'd great love to be just here. To, oh, well, thank you for, for coming. Yeah. And we'd just love to hear a bit about you um, and sort of your incredible journey um, to, to where you are today. <laughs> That's a much longer story than we probably got. But, yeah. but, but, but I, know you want, I know you want to talk about COVID. Yes. And I know you want to talk about, you know, what, what on earth are we going to understand and learn about contemporary forms of slavery and human trafficking if we're also in the middle of this, of this pandemic? Yes. And, 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 and also watching the strange impact of this pandemic, especially on political and cultural systems. You know, the, the, the medical response is clear. It's, it's sort of the politicization of all that response that's, that's then also churning up a lot of things that have to do with uh, ethnicities and who, which, which type of people might be to blame and what you do with those people who are to blame and what if those people are, are in fact, say, migrants and, and then all of a sudden the vulnerabilities increase. So there's a lot of complexity to it and it's all happened very quickly, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. But you've been, you've been researching and studying and being a professor of, of modern slavery um, for how many years now? Oh, a number. I can't remember. I, it's been <laughs> at, least, at least 10 years, something like that. Yeah. Is it right to say that you coined the term modern slavery? No, I couldn't say that because, you know, there's, there's the, I mean, the term modern slavery, in fact, has a different meaning in the world of historians. You know, that basically means in the modern era, like since the year 1600. Right. So they've used that term for a very long time. But there was certainly that notion of as we began to help spread an understanding globally in about the year 2000 was when we really launched into it. When you say slavery to people and they'd say, but that's over, that didn't happen anymore. That all ended in the 19th century. And, and also there are many places in the world where just using the term slavery has a lot of cultural echo and baggage. That's it. That's true in the United States, obviously, but it's also true in parts of West Africa. It's also true in India yeah. in a very powerful way. They, you know, they say, you know, we can't have slavery because slavery is what the British did to us. Uh, so right. that's, you know, they have this own, they have this particular box they want to put that, that word into. Modern slavery calms it down a little bit. So yeah. we, can, we can spread it around and, and, and at least have something to agree on. Um, Kevin, I have not had a chance to visit, but I know that Eugenie has. I'd love to hear more about the Rights Lab. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I'd be very happy to talk about it. I'm very excited about the Rights Lab. I, you know, it's, it's a bit of a dream come true for me personally that I never dreamt that dream could come true. But mm -hmm. what happened was that after I joined the University of Nottingham, the, the university itself had an internal competition. The University of Nottingham is a very large university and it's world number one in two or three areas like um, MRI brain scans. They invented it there. They got a Nobel Prize for it and that sort of thing. They're world number one in a few areas. They said, what else can we do as a university to be world number one? And they put out a call to, for teams to build that. Uh, they were thinking hard science. So they were getting people who wanted to make electric airplanes and so forth. But we said, why don't we go world number one in research and understanding of, of contemporary slavery? And made a, a case over a couple of years and put the team together. And it's turned out to be, um, I'll say, the most successful of all the, all the world number one teams that they've been trying to build as a university, which means we have about 85 researchers uh, just focusing on contemporary slavery, as well as a lot of research assistants, as well as a lot of support staff. And they're spread across a whole number of teams from satellite, a team that just works with satellite imagery and satellites, down to people who work on MRI of brain scans and, and psychology of people who have been in slavery, and, and supply chains and natural disasters and you name it. So we were at conflict and, and, and forced marriage and women, the enslavement of women. So all of those are very large and active research areas. And we've been just pushing the research agenda very quickly and discovering things that are, uh, Can you for talk me, thrilling. Sorry, interrupt, sorry. I just what? wondered if you could talk a bit about, um, you, you research, you said natural disasters. So yeah. 
you, you can call, would you call COVID a natural disaster? Well, in many ways, yes, of course. I mean, it, it's not the sort that people normally think about when they think about hurricanes and cyclones and, and yeah. tsunamis and that sort of thing. Uh, but it certainly had a, a very powerful impact, uh, you know, and you could call it a, as a pandemic, you could call it a natural disaster. We're just, we're not used to pandemics, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a sort of a surprise uh, you can see by the disarray all around the world. But one of the things that we had, you know, there was for a long time uh, a kind of theme in the popular notions about human trafficking and natural disasters like cyclones and hurricanes or the tsunami. And that was that there was a, there was this notion that, wow, if, you know, if a, if a hurricane has hit this poor area in Bangladesh or Burma or wherever, uh, or even New Orleans, then surely the human traffickers rush in there and yeah. begin to pluck away the, the innocent potential victims and, and make off with them and so forth. Um, that was a nice, scary uh, kind of meme, but it wasn't really true, right? In almost every place where there was an earthquake like Haiti and so forth, traffickers didn't rush in, they didn't fly in and grab children. Um, in large part because you can't, because everything's destroyed. So you can't rush into those sorts of places. But what does happen is that the people who are already engaged in that type of crime will basically pull back shortly and then change their, their modus operandi. So they'll actually adapt to the situation. So when we looked at places like Burma after the tsunami, tsunami or New Orleans after um, Katrina hurricane, you saw that there was, a, in a sense, a complete pause in that type of crime, but only for a week or two. And then it would change. It would be changed in the way it was being carried out and, and, the, and the nature of the victims and so forth. So instead of being, say, in New Orleans after Katrina, being all about commercial sexual exploitation, trafficking into sexual exploitation, a lot of it became trafficking into reconstruction projects that, that were then, you know, they were illegally, you know, using these workers, but, but, but in a sense, taking the money off the government to rebuild and, and, and or, or wreckage clearance and things like that. So there's an adaptation. That's what you have to watch out for is how, how will the, the bad guys adapt to the situation? And that's the question that we're asking a lot about COVID around the world is, you know, what's going to happen? One of the, one of the worry, I'll stop after and when I tell you this, but like one of the things that we're watching very carefully that we're worried about is in, in, in South Asia and South, in particularly South India, there are some 10 to 20,000 young people and some of them children who are working in textiles. And some of those are in situations of trafficking and enslavement. But, but the COVID has led to a complete cessation of orders for these tex textile factories. So we have possibly 10,000 or 20,000 fundamentally children who may just be dumped on the street at any moment because the slaveholders or the people controlling them no longer want to feed them. They don't have any reason to, to, to keep them or anything. And then, we'll, and, and then they'll be dumped into a context in which there are extreme controls because of the virus. Now what do we do? Well, that's something we're thinking about. And also we're monitoring the, con the situation very closely to say, what, you know, what can we do and, and has it begun or what can we do to prevent it from happening? That, and that's just one example of a whole world of highly vulnerable people made more vulnerable by the virus. Gosh. And so it's so for us, people working to combat modern slavery, we've got a huge job ahead of us to adapt to the new normal. Yes, if we could even see what the normal is. And also, Julia, interesting you say that because I was wondering during that, you know, you were saying that the traffickers have adapted after these disastrous events, but how fast do the good guys adapt? You know, do you know what I mean? I was just, that's exactly what you're just saying, you know? Well, it, you know, I, I, you look across all, all studies of criminology and not just to do with trafficking and slavery. And, and a fundamental lesson is that criminals adapt more rapidly than good guys. And, and they have to because they, they, they're 
the criminal economy, you know, when people say, I want to, you know, I want to destroy the competition or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to wipe out the competition and people say that in business, but they don't literally mean kill people. Yeah. But in criminal businesses, they do literally mean kill people. Right. They and have to you, work that much faster. And they do. And they, and they work very quickly and they adapt very quickly and, because their risks are so much higher. Right. Both of being apprehended, but but even more so often of their criminal competitors. So it's a it's a it's a fascinating. Sorry, it's also fascinating. It's 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 chilling, and it's scary. But it's also like, how do we begin to think through this in new ways? And how has your work at the Rights Lab been affected? I mean, presumably you had to close down for lockdown. Yes, and though we were already pretty good at at zooming. Right. Yeah. We had we had already a whole series of permanent meeting rooms because we have people working all over the world. So so a lot of what we were doing hasn't been affected in a big way. Um, there is a financial crunch going on across the university sector because suddenly people are not in signing up or paying fees and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so there's a question about sort of that sort of thing. But we're we're just rocking along as best we can. And but we immediately put together a, a task force, which has produced a document. Uh, which we've already circulated out on, on Twitter and everywhere else about here's, here are ways that we need to be thinking about this and, and here are our short-term questions, medium-term questions, long-term questions, and so forth. How, do, how, are we gonna, how are we going to address these vulnerabilities? There's all these other things that have kind of linked in as well. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've seen some of the stats, but it's like consumption of online pornography has dramatically increased in a lot of numbers, a lot of countries, uh, yeah. and is way up in South Asia, for example, and way up in the United States. And we know that there is trafficking in, uh, you know, enslavement and trafficking of people into abuse online. It's that strange new type of slavery that's never existed before in human history, where people are literally being exploited by 200 people or 2,000 people at the same time, as opposed to one at a time, Yeah. but online. We were learning about that from, from the uh, report that the um, IJM did in the Philippines. That's right. It's, it's crazy, the, the numbers. Yes. And, and we can only assume that that's expanding. But the assumption and the measurement are two different things, and they take longer. The measurement takes longer. So in some ways, just as some of the governments are doing, trying to play catch up with this, we're also trying to play catch up and also put out fires. Yeah. So, if a lot of this is moving to online, is there not a much bigger part that data, artificial intelligence and technology companies can play in detecting all of this? Yes, I think so, absolutely. The, the question in some ways becomes convincing them to do so. Yeah. And... You know, I've had conversations with Facebook and visited them over in Dublin several times at their headquarters there. And they want to do the right thing, but they're also very frightened, really, of putting the, their foot wrong or gathering any sort of bad publicity. And, and you know, you can't, <laughs> you, you can't really fight for human rights if you're also looking over your shoulder and seeing yeah. if anyone's going to frown at you. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, could you, could you tell us what can we do as an anti-slavery movement? How can we learn from COVID, adapt, and how can we um, sort of keep fighting on during, after this, this pandemic is hopefully going to finish? Well, I, I think the answer to your question is one I don't know, really, in, in, its, fu in its fullness. Yeah. Right? I, you know, because if we start just where we are, and we look in, in, in the UK, and we say, wow, let's say you're in the national referral mechanism, uh, you've been given leave to remain. You've been determined to actually have a, a be, be a, a trafficked or enslaved person, uh, but now they're going to place you in a, in a housing. But the housing has has normally been in situations where you'd be crammed often closely with other people that you didn't even know. How do how do we fix a whole bunch of questions and problems like that that have to do with the protection? of human life within the mechanism. And that's see, and that's just that's a very that's a very narrow policy question that has to do with public health as well. And then you begin to expand that out to other countries and what happens about people crossing indoor well, 
it's interesting that we've, we, in a sense, we've, we've closed borders everywhere. And that's, that's going to alter. And in some ways, that may actually do something positive if it stops cross-border trafficking for a while. But then you have to say, but what's happening to the people? Yeah. It's a bit like those, like those child workers in, in India. In some ways, for them to be just dumped from their factories could be a good thing in that they would come out from under the violent control of the people who were using them. But only if, you know, you don't want to dump, you don't want to see people liberated and just to starve in a gutter. You've got to, you know, you, we've got to be looking, doing a lot of granular work. I was looking at a report from Talitha Kum. Do you know that organization? Yes. Yeah, you know, it's, it's basically the Catholic religious sisters around the world who, who work on trafficking. And they were saying the same sorts of things. You know, they were saying where, because since they live right at the granular edge, they were saying, we're just seeing a lot of need and we're seeing a lot of people needing care, uh, which is what they do all the time, but it's just all the more so now. Kevin, what can our listeners do to help? What do you think the most important role they have to play is? Well, you know, for a lot of people around who who aren't able to say act to be actively engaged as well, as much as we are, um, and I can also understand why you might not want to be actively engaged as much as we are. You know, this is a it's a it's a big job, and it and it can also be a bit heart wrenching and like that, but but you can feel it in your heart and want to do something about it. It sounds really boring, but at the moment, the most powerful thing almost any listener could do is just two things. First, learn more, which isn't hard because there's a lot out there to learn. Look at your publications, our publications, read books, look at so forth. But also then financially support some of the charities that do work in this space. And, you know, happily the Rights Lab doesn't need to be a charity that needs to be supported, but anti-slavery is, international justice mission is, you know, on and on they go. Um, I think they're going to be needing some cash flow to, to, to address these, this sudden upsurge in real challenges. And, and, you know, we've all known for some time from some of the cost benefit analysis work that, that really the most powerful thing that people in rich countries can do is actually just support the work in poor countries because their pounds or dollars or whatever go so far in those countries so much further than they do. You know, it's sort of like a couple of Starbucks and you've kitted out a kid yeah. to, to come to freedom. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing, even though it's not very glamorous, right? It, it's, not, it's not as exciting as you might want it to be, but it's, but it's actually much more effective. Yeah, I think one of the things that Jules and I have been learning from these working from home conversations is that, um, you know, a lot of everything really happens from these grassroots organizations that are taking place right then and there. You know, we spoke to Arise Foundation and IGM and all these different people who really have fingers in with all these amazing um, networks who are right on the ground. Yes. Because without them during COVID, our access would be completely cut off. Precisely. Kevin, we always like to ask for a story of hope at the end, because this can be a very serious, heavy topic. So an uplifting story from you would be wonderful for our listeners. Well, you know, I can, I can go back to northern India for a minute, where we've been working for almost 15 years now with hereditary forms of slavery in agricultural villages, where almost everyone in the, these small villages has been in hereditary slavery. But we've now worked with these villages for all this much time and have worked out strong mechanisms that help them come to freedom. And over 150 of these villages have now gone from slavery villages to being totally free villages and free economies and tra transformed lives and schools built in every single one of them and so forth. Here's the, here's the hope here. It, and it's this, that I thought, okay, what's happening up in North India? right? This is desperately poor area. We know there's still plenty of villages in, in slavery and so forth. And when, but when I checked in on them all, I, what I discovered was the women's groups who had been organized to fight for freedom and liberty, the 
organizers in, in the local NGOs had actually mobilized on COVID before Britain did, wow. before governments did. Wow. They could see this coming. They thought about what they needed to do. They had rationed out um, face masks and that sort of thing. They had decided when there was a shortage, who was going to get them because they were going to be most able to help most of the other people. They had separated and, and made bubbles to protect people. And I thought, you know, people in freedom who can make their own choices and have, de have learned how to determine their own futures can de determine to make life better and to protect the vulnerable. And it was just so powerful. You know, we think of people who have come out of slavery as sometimes being pathetic beings who just have to be cared for. No, what we really need to do is let people who have come out of slavery care for us yeah. and teach us how to help others come to freedom. That's such a nice story. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, just before we end, just to let everyone know that if they'd like to learn more about what Kevin does, they can go to the Rights Lab, right? Yes, sure. Online. Um, yeah. And you can also go on Instagram and look for them. And also, same for us um, with the Anti Savory Collective. So you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter and all those things. Thank you so much, Kevin Bales, for joining our Working From Home conversation. I think some of the main takeaways for us are the fact that organized crime and human traffickers are very, very adaptive. So during this time, we're going to have to all adjust to a new normal and find out the new ways. We've already seen an increase in online sexual explo exploitation as an example. Um, and I think another takeaway for our listeners um, is to learn more and to support those organizations around you who need the support and talk about it. Raise awareness, talk about it amongst your friends um, and share this video on Instagram. Yes. <laughs>